Okay. All right, so without further ado, let me get the exam up here. Okay, so so here we are. We we, we are starting with the um the I think this was the first paper that you all did, if I'm not mistaken. I think we, we, we mentioned that. So this is what threw everything off off the rails for you. First face to face after two years and and um it didn't go too well. So anyway, let, let's um go through here. Um if you recall the the topics the, for this course are largely along um, five sections, right? We, we have a discussion, part of the course deals with power supplies, part deals with op-amp applications, um, part deals with waveform generators, part deals with active filters, and then the last part with the, the configuration for feedback amplifiers. There isn't a lot of circuit analysis and, and, and deliberately, the course isn't one where you where at this point you have to remember a lot of diagrams to draw. It was more given the the, the, um, the information if you could analyze it. And in some cases, I was a little bit surprised at, at, at um, what happened because I think some of this stuff was fairly easy to rationalize, and as as we'll see going forward here. Okay, so. Um, feel free to stop me. Uh, um, as you have to draw your atten my attention, as I said, by, by um, talking to me. So I'll at least look to see what, what's happening. So at any point in time, feel free to um, come in and, and ask for, for clarification, right? Um, the, quest, the, the exam paper and the solutions are posted. So you can have a look at it again. We'll go through it here. But of course, for part of, part of your own revision, and equally, um, like I mentioned before, equally, well, I've put the, the Google Sheet up if there are any things that you need clarified, right? Um, the, the website, the My Learning page is still on. So the slides are still accessible. Um, the, the problem sets on solutions are still accessible. The videos are now on the YouTube link that I sent you, right? Um, and they are ordered by the, the by topic name. So, so you can go through and, and, and find the topic and, and, and see like what you want, right? You can play over that as well too. Okay, so um, let's have a look at, at, at this and, and let's get through this this morning. So question one, this, this, this part of the question was dealing with um, a circuit there that you were given. So again, I didn't expect you to, to, to remember to draw the circuit and to explain the circuit um, in response to an input. And you're being told that a one volt peak to peak signal is sent into the signal, into the circuit, sorry, and, and something is going to happen. Generally for, for most of the op arm circuits, all you have to do for electronics is to remember what the configuration for an inverting amp and a non-inverting. You have to remember what the diagrams for those things look like, right? What is the schematic arrangement for that? And from the time you have an arrangement now with what is looking like in this case an inverting amplifier, and then you have some diodes in it. Once you have that in there, you're beginning to talk about something most likely called a precision a precision rectifier. And just quick review, you remember that a diode in a normal rectifier circuit, anything less than about 0.7 volts can't be rectified by the diode because it wouldn't be biased uh, to conduct. So if you have signals that are smaller than 0.7 volts, what you need is some other system that can rectify it. And because of the behavior of an op amp, the op amp will take signals that are less than 0.7 volts, but the behavior of the op amp will, and as we will see in a, in a little while, will work in such a way to make the diodes turn on um, even though the input is less than the 0.7 volts, all right? 
So in point form, um, explain the operation of the circuit. So what I expected here, again, in point form is trying to, to get, the, get the solutions in, in, in a fairly straightforward way so that you don't have to, to write a lot of English. I was trying to save that. So for instance here, what you would say for instance, VN is positive. So if VN is positive on, on this circuit, it is an inverting amplifier, right? Forget the diode for the time being. If VN is positive, so as soon as this goes positive, let me see if I can get the, the Right, if Vn was positive, because of the inverting amplifier arrangement, just right, because of the inverting amplifier arrangement, the instant Vn goes positive the output of the op amp here is going to go negative, right? So VOA is going to drop. As soon as VOA drops, then now you start to look at what the, the diodes are doing. If VOA is negative, then it means that diode D1 here is negative, here is positive, well, relatively speaking, and I'll talk about that in a second. So this diode turns on. If here goes negative, this diode turns off. The thing about it is that the up amp behavior, remember we have this, this virtual earth behavior here between the two, the, the two inputs. Even though as Vn goes positive, the virtual earth, the, the up amp tries to make here equal to this voltage here, which is zero. And in doing that, in order to do that, what it does, it actually sends here to about minus 0.7 volts, which is why the diode here is biased. Here remains at zero, but it sends the cathode of the, in other words, VOOA goes negative, just about minus 0.7 volts, just enough to, 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 to bias the diode on. And as we mentioned in class, the diodes now work like short circuits. So if this diode is on and D1 is conducting, but because here is negative, D2 is off, then what happens is that there's no electrical connection between VOA and this point here. This is off of the circuit. Hello? Yes, have a second. Had a phone call there. Right, so, so because there's no electrical connection now, the, the um, D2 is off. And if here is zero, then there's no current flow. So here is going to be a zero as well. So when Vn is positive, Vo is zero or off. Okay. If Vn goes negative now, then Vn negative, then the inverting amplifier raises VOA to positive. It turns off diode D1 and turns on diode D2 now. Okay, so I could almost scratch that off here a little bit, right? So it turns off D1. So in other words, if you, if you like now, D1, let me go change the color here. D1 is now out of the circuit and D2 is now a short circuit, okay? All right, so V in negative, we bias D2 now. And once that is done, the output VOA is now connected to VO. All right, it's inverting, so the output VOA is positive now. So for a negative input, we have a positive output. For a positive input, we have nothing, right? So that was the explanation of it. The circuit 
behaves like an inverter. Drawing the, um, the second part of the question asks you to draw what the input would look like. So if there's a one volt um, signal coming in, you have a little AC signal coming in. This now, when the signal is positive, you have no output. When it is negative, the system, the, the, the precision rectifier rectifies it, but it inverts it. So you get a, for a negative input, you get a positive output. Positive input, nothing. Negative input, you get a positive output, okay? So that's what the marks was. And the type of circuit was an inverting half wave precision rectifier, okay? So we inserted the word precision here. Right? So if you go back to the diagram, go back to the question paper here. Right, so these are it. it so, so essentially in, in point form, right? You explained and you got the five marks for explaining that in point form. And then there were three marks for sketching the, the input and output um, waveforms. And the last, type where it was, what, what, what is the circuit? Now, the funny thing about it is that there were a couple of you all who got this part correct, right? You explained it correct and you got the part correct, but yet when it was here, you, you, you didn't realize it was an inverting, in some cases, didn't, didn't say it was a rectifier at all. In some cases, you pointed out here that the signal is inverted. Right, or in your explanation up here that the signal was inverted, but yet when it came 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 down to, to saying what the circuit was, you forgot to say it was an inverting um, half wave precision rectifier. All right? Okay. Any any questions or comments on that? Hi, hey, sir. Mm -hmm. um... In terms of the um, the virtual earth, you said that it tries to, to match the, the ground? What happens is the virtual earth behavior tries to make the inverting and non-inverting terminal voltages match, right? So in other words, the, the, up amp, the up amp tries to equalize the voltages at these two terminals here. So for instance, there, there, there are certain times when you could, you could put, um, let's say you had a bias voltage here, right? So you had some VB on this terminal. What would happen is that, that it tries to make these two equal. So at some point you will get this VB also appearing at the, at the, um, at the inverting um, terminal as well. It happens that in this case, we don't have, we, we, we have grounded the non-inverting terminal so here we'll be trying to, 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 to be zero, all right? But as the behavior, if you look at the schematic, if you go back to, to um, uh, I don't know if you would have had the, the, the internals. Did you do differential amplifiers, um, transistor differential amplifiers at all in, in, in year one electronics? Anybody, you, you all did that? Um, not sure, but most likely. Right. What happens if you if you look at it, you will see you will see the circuit arrangement that causes that to happen. Okay, there's a little circuit arrangement inside of there, and once one of the inputs is active, it tries because of a, of something where it's trying to duplicate the collector current in, in the two transistors that that operate. The, one one is on the inverting and one is on the non-inverting, so it tries to make the two voltages equal here, and that's what we call the virtual earth behavior. Normally in, in this application, like, like the inverting amplifier, if you forget the diodes, because um, the, the non-inverting input is grounded, this point here becomes um, a ground as well. And that's why we call it a virtual loop. But the behavior is that, the, the, the whole behavior is, is the virtual loop behavior. It is trying to make the two inputs internally be this, at the same voltage level, right? Obviously, it can't be exactly, and, I, and, and it is trying to do that, that the current flows and the device works, right? If it didn't, then, then, then the amplifier would not really function at all. Okay, but that's, it, it's attempting to create that behavior, and the better the op-amp, the closer those two terminals become to being equal. 
in terms of um, terminal voltage. Yeah? All right, part B. Part B was an instrumentation amplifier and, and it was asking you to, to prove a particular um, uh, relationship and then want to give an explanation of the advantage over uh, of the op amp, sorry, the, 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 the instrumentation amplifier over a differential amplifier. Remember the normal differential amplifier looks like this thing on this side here. This is the normal differential amplifier here. And what it does is that if you have a voltage V1 here and a voltage V2 here, what it tries to give you is V2 minus V1, right? Depending on the values of R1 and R2, you get a gain. And really and truly what they're trying to do uh, is that these, they, 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 they feedback and input and they ground and, and, and um, input resistor here are supposed to be um, equal. They're supposed to match. Right? If all are equal to, to each other here, then the gain will be one. The problem with this, of course, as we saw is that, and we did some calculations, if R2 and R, if the two R2, so if this one here and this one here are not identically matched, then they, they, although the they amplifier works, well, they, there's a degradation in something that we call the common mode rejection ratio. Right, and you'll have to go back the notes, and we could we could cover it again when 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 you go through the the uh, the, the material um, or some of the material later on. So what we do to, to 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 basically make the ordinary differential amplifier um, work better is that we put these two buffers on it, one buffer here, and one buffer here. Oops, and that creates. that creates this thing here that we call that we now call an instrumentation amplifier. So proving the, 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 for the, that formula here was actually um, fairly easy. The first thing that you had to do, of course, was if you have VDIF coming in here, right? If you have VDIF coming in on, on, on the amplifier, you need to calculate what is the current going through here. All right, this is, a, this is a, a buffer here, so that you, whatever is going on the input here is going to appear on the output here. All right, you could, well, actually, actually no, let me backtrack that a little bit. Uh, right, whatever is going here is actually going to appear here. Shouldn't have said that, here. Right, by the same virtual root behavior that we had, because this, point and this point are equal. So if V diff is appearing here, okay, then the current through RG will simply be V diff over RG. And that current now flows this way. So that the voltage at the output here Right, let me call that V out one, V out prime, right? Will be now this current, right? Multiplied by um, RF plus RG plus RF, okay? So that's the voltage that is appearing at V out prime and then the normal differential amplifier here, the, 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 the single op amp differential amplifier, you could calculate the gain of that. And remember the gain of that, it has to do with R2 and R1. So you put that into the equation here and eventually you get that expression coming up right there. Okay, so you can see right here, right? This is two RF plus RG over RG. Right, which is one plus two RF over RG and then R2 over R1, which is the gain of the up amp here. Right, so if you look here, and that in fact was straight from the notes. Right, I'll get to that in a second. 
So the standard defam, we had that in the notes, right? How we calculated the, the, the gains and then adding the, the, the normal differential amplifier, the standard defam for the output. Okay, and that, that proved the, the answer right there. The other part of the question was asking you, um, was there the, the part here, let me see. Part two was asking you, give uh, two advantages of the instrumentation amplifier over the single op amp, okay? But if you go back here, the first problem with the single op amp differential amplifier is that if I have to change the gain, you remember the gain of the amplifier, here is, uh, um, the stylus is giving me a little problem. I have to remember where to press with it, right? The gain of this is R2 over R1. But we have two of two R2s and we have two R1s that have to be matched, right? As close as possible to, to, to being identical. If I want to change the gain of this amplifier here, then I have to change the two values of R2 or the two values of R1 at the same time and make sure that they are matched, okay? That's part of the problem. And the second part of the problem is that the input resistance, for instance, here is very low, right? The input resistance of these devices is essentially R1, okay? So what we do is that by putting these two additional op amps here and here, we one, we, we make the gain only a function now of one resistor, right? So the gain is now a function of one resistor. And because these are two buffers here and here, the input impedance is now significantly higher, right? And there were some other ones that if you go to the slide and I accepted any of those, any two of those in the, um, in, in for the answer, so, one, it had a high input impedance, low bias current. The gain was determined by, by, um, by changing um, uh, two resistors as opposed to four matched ones, right? So you change RF or RG, or in fact, you could just change RG alone and leave RF as common. So any of those two, right? This was what have been one of the topics that, that was not on the um, was not on the um, sort of agenda for the previous iteration of this. And um, I don't know if because it was that new that people had a little bit of an issue, but it's a very easy circuit to analyze. Right? And it's back down to the same thing. Um, for op amps, op amp circuits, you need to know um, what a what the inverting uh, amplifier arrangement is, the non-inverting amplifier arrangement is, and then of course our buffer doesn't have any feedback resistors in them, so so it's it's fairly straightforward. Okay, so any questions on that? Clarifications? Yeah. And you should have been able to even even in the exam, if even they they, they face a face through you, you should have been able to I, I think to, to, to get get past part of this problem um, at least they, they they part one here and the explanation of this bit here. Somebody wanted to ask a question. So it just basically following what you have. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, so it, it, it wasn't that difficult. Um, it shouldn't have been that difficult. I know they, they, as I said, the recall was, um, might have been an issue, but doing it, um, if you had reviewed the material, then um, at least once you understood what it was, it, it should have been fairly easy to come up with a, some sort of an explanation. It's 20 marks for, for a question, right? So to pass on average, right, if, you, if you're really in a struggle, um, you need to answer about half the question, okay, right? And you have, have the marks there, so. Right, of course, I expect people to do a little bit better than that. Okay, so question two now had to do with oscillators. That was the other one of the other topics that we had. And the first thing was why, why was it 
um, important for an oscillator, a sinusoidal oscillator to satisfy something called the Barkhausen criterion. Remember the Barkhausen criterion had to do with the gain of the oscillator, right? The loop gain. And we had a little diagram of it, right? About here. Right. So essentially, once you put feedback around an op amp, um, and we, 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 we looked at that and we put in positive feedback. And remember positive feedback, remember from your signals and systems that positive feedback gives you a, a negative sign here when you, when you simplify the, the, the block diagram itself. If a, B, if a, B is equal to one, then theoretically um, the denominator here is going to be zero. And so that what happens is that again, V out over V in approaches infinity. So in theory, if you get A, B getting close to one, then in theory, because of the high gain of the circuit, this thing is going to want to, um, you're getting an output theory, theoretically without an input, all right? And then to get the positive feedback, what you need is that the phase change as you go through the network. You remember, we just um, we just spoke about um, uh, when we were doing the, the asymptotic plots for, 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 for the example a little bit earlier on this morning. Those of you who were there, um, there's a magnitude and a phase response to all transfer functions. If the phase response for this transfer function here is such that they, they is zero degrees or a multiple of two pi, then you're going to get the, the, the phase shift is going to create the, the, the positive feedback. And what is going to happen then is that you're going to get, um, if you have positive feedback, it means that once you generate an output, the output is going to feedback positively to the input. And if you, if you remove the input, then the thing is going to sustain itself indefinitely. That is in theory, okay? But that is it. And, and this whole arrangement here, where the gain is one, the, the magnitude of the gain is one and the phase angle is zero is what we call the Barkhausen criteria, all right? And that is, and, 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 and you need that um, because it will create the, the phase shift, will give it a positive feedback and you will be able to get the oscillation without an input coming in. All right, so that was the first um, couple of parts here. So um, from the previous diagram, right? the current IG will be the current going through the resistor RG. Hold on. Previous, you mean in the solutions here? In the operational amplifier circuit. This one? Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. I'm not sure about that IG current. Where is that nice. going okay. through? OK, so just to backtrack a little bit. If you look, I'll, I'll do it on this on, uh, on here for you. Because of, okay, so we have V diff appearing between this point here and this point here, right? Because of the virtual earth behavior, remember this terminal and this terminal, the up amp essentially is supposed to be an equal voltage. So whatever is appearing here is also appearing at this point. So in other words, V diff is, appearing between the inverting inputs here now, right? Which is right literally across RG. So V diff is now across RG, right? Make sense? Yeah. Right, so if V diff is across RG, then the current that is passing through RG will be V diff divided by RG. So they saw it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I right. understand. Right. So the current through RG is V diff over RG. This current here through these lines here, remember the op amp again, under ideal conditions, the op amp takes very little current. So therefore, most of our IG is really passing this way. Right? IG will be doing this. 
Yeah. So if IG is passing through there, then you can now calculate what is the voltage between the output of A1 and A2, which is IG by RF plus RG plus RF prime, right? And if both of them equal, then is, is, is I, IG into two RF plus RG, right? Mm -hmm. And then you, you, and then the S is a normal differential amplifier. Okay. And this V01 voltage, I see you have that noted there, but. V01, V01 is this voltage here. That is the output between A1 and A2. So that is the output of A1 to A2. Oh, and that is being fed into A3 amplifier. Correct. And the gain of, so that is being fed into A3, and the gain of A3 is R3 over R2. All right. All right. If you look at the slides, the, 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 the actual um, slides, it's in color. So, so, so you'll see this a lot more clearly. It printed in black and white. It was copied in black and white, but it's, in, it's actually yellow, and you see it very brightly in the, in, on, the, on the actual handles. I didn't quite get that, that comment. Why is VN1? Oh, it, it, no, it, it, it didn't matter. That is just um, arbitrary. It, uh, that was just, if you, if you go back to the explanations that we, we had, you could do it either way, right? Remember an um, input here, an input for V, V diff or V common mode, um, with maybe AC. So at some point in time, VN plus will be here and VN minus will be here. So it doesn't really matter. I just arbitrarily chose it here. But as you can see, it doesn't really make, um, it doesn't pay into the, um, have any effect on the calculation that we're doing. V diff, I have a double ended RO here. So V diff could be either polarity. It makes absolutely no difference. But I was just for the purposes of, of, of joining the diagram. Okay, Joshua? Hey, yes, sir. Um, just one question, right? We only analyzing half of the circuit as it going to amplifier A1. I no, see. A1 and A2 work together. Mm -hmm. So as a differential voltage appears across the, the differential voltage is a, appearing across the, between the positive, the, the non-inverting terminal or input for A2 and A1. So it's appearing here, but because of the virtual earth behavior that I just mentioned, it is actually appearing directly across RG. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, so back to the, so we have this. Okay, so that, that took care of the, the, um, the first part here asking you about the bark housing. The second part now asks you, okay, so, so a student comes up with a, a thing that has a loop gain given by that function. What would be the resonant frequency in order to satisfy the Barkhausen criterion, and then what would be the gain of the amplifier in order to satisfy the Barkhausen criterion? So the first part is that the frequency of this has to be such that that a beta, the magnitude of a beta, is one. The first, well, of course, you have to expand this, and in, and to go from s to frequency, we have to make the substitution s equal to j omega. If we go back to the, the, the solution here, S equal to J omega and you expand and simplify. Okay? So as you expand and simplify now, you get it in, in, in this form here. And what you do, of course, so it is AB, uh, J omega now, so this is the frequency response of A beta, and you group it between the real and imaginary parts, of course. So you have the one plus, one minus three omega squared, et cetera. And then you have the part with the, the, the imaginary part together. In order for, so the, the, the phase shift for this to work according to the Barkhausen criterion, the phase shift has to be zero or a multiple of two pi. The only way the phase shift of this could be zero is if this bit is zero. In other words, the imaginary part drops out. 
So if this bit is zero, to make this zero, you have to solve this part for omega to see what value of omega will make this zero. And that's a simple solution here. You could you solve it through and you get that if omega zero is, is root three over RC, then this, the imaginary part becomes zero so that the phase shift around the loop is now zero degrees, okay? And then to answer the other part of the question, um, what is the gain of the circuit? Now that you know what the resonant frequency is, which is root three over RC, you plug it back into this equation here, right into the, the, the original equation. And at that point in time, you get into the magnitude of that is some K over eight, okay? So that the only way, and K of course is R1, R, R1 over R. So the only way that this could be one, remember the, the Barkhausen criterion is that the magnitude of A beta or J omega has to be one. So if K over eight has to be one, then K has to be eight, right? K and of course K is the, 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 was the gain of the circuit. So that's answering the second part here. Yeah? Everybody all right with that? Right, it was again, I didn't give you this, I didn't ask you to draw the diagram here. So I gave you the, in fact, I gave you the answer. So from the time you have to do this uh, and you see, okay, what is the resonant frequency? Okay, I've given you something in terms of S. If I have to calculate frequency, the instant you see this means that at some point in time, now I have to, from the time I see that to answer the question, I have to let S equal J omega, right? From the time you see frequency coming in and I've given you a transfer function in terms of S, then the next step is to make the substitution S equal to J omega. Once you do that and simplify, it's easier to expand this first, then substitute J omega. And then from part A, the, the Barkhausen part meant that the angle of this thing the phase angle must be equal to zero or multiple of two pi, but we work with zero because it's easier to solve. And if I give you a complex number, one over A plus J B, right? The phase angle of that, remember the phase angle of that um, is, is the, the arctan basically of B and A. So if I want that not um, to be zero, this bit here, has to be zero. So we look at what is in here and what does it take to make B zero? And that's what we are solving. And then the other part now is that, okay, so I have this here, right? I have it in the, 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 the transfer function when I make the, the, the um, substitution. Um, so I'll have A beta, oh, A beta J omega will be minus R over R1 over one plus J omega naught RC, all this cubed, right? If I know omega naught now from the next part, I just plug it into here, right? Or plug it into the, the other part where you simplified it. And at that point in time, you will get, when you simplify it now, you're going to get that this thing here, the magnitude of it is going to be K over eight. And that has to be equal to one for the Barkhausen criteria to work. So the only way that could, could work is if K is equal to eight, okay? Which is the gain of the, um, the, the, the circuit here, all right? And this again is straight. In fact, this particular problem is straight from one of the, the class examples that we did straight from a slide. So it's, it's almost taken directly from, from, from that. I just gave you the answer. The, 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 the class had the thing was three, three, was three up arms. There were three of them with the, the, the phase network between each one. So one, each one is feed, feeding the other one. And we had the feedback going back to the gain amplifier, right? And if you look at it inside of here, the, the solution for the three up arm bits were in fact this. We derived that in class and 
But instead of giving you the circuit, I give you the answer and ask you to derive the, the solution. All right? And this part now, okay, show the magnitude of, of this. Right, so what you're doing here is that V out over V in is a three part solution. Well, you, you have to calculate, okay. Um, that's not where am I? You have Z1, Z1 here, which is a RC series. You have Z2 here, and the output here, V out over V in is equal to um, uh, Z2 over Z1 plus Z2. Okay, that's a, the, the Weinberg network. If you, if you recall, the Weinberg network is two, um, is, is two things, a, a series RC and a parallel RC. And you're taking the, the output of the, of the interface of the two um, sort of sub-circuits of, of those two impedances there. So if you substitute for Z1 and Z2, so do you have Z1 and Z2 here? And then um, after you do that, you make the substitution S equal to J omega and simplify, you would get the equation here, okay? It's a straight derivation and it's straight from the notes um, again, all right? I think it was five marks for that part. Okay, question three. So here we are, we have a, a power supply. Let me put it up here. So this is a power supply here. And I asked, um, there were uh, six voltages and four currents in here. And I asked, um, the, the question was given that power supply. So I didn't ask you to draw the power supply. Given the power supply and that is operating at full load, calculate the values of all the voltages and currents. And you didn't have to calculate any resistor values at all. So it, it was straight interpretation, all right? So you look at the thing, it's a 15 volt one amp supply. So you take the diagram and you start writing all things if you like. So if I look at it straight off, this is 15 volts, right? One amp. One amp is a full load current, which is this. Remember, RL is a load. So that I1 is one amp. So you have two other voltages. You have two answers there already. You have V2 and you have I1. Yeah? So you go back now. The power for the regulator comes from an unregulated supply using a full wave rectifier and a 15 volt transformer with a ripple voltage of one volt peak to peak. So if it's 15 volts, it means that the unregulated voltage here is 15 multiplied by root two, right? Which I think is, is 21 point something, right? 21.2 or something like that, right? 21.2 uh, uh, volts, good. So at full load, and I'm, I'm trying to show you how, how straightforward it, I intended it to be, right? So if it's there and, and you're calculating everything at full load, full load is one amp. So if you have, you remember how they, rect how they full wave rectifier voltage after you filter it and so on, you get, you will get, you're going to get something looking like, like this, right? And, the peak to peak, the peak voltage is 21.2. The peak to peak ripple is one volt. So therefore at full load, remember the higher, at, at no load, the output of the unregulated supply would be somewhere around here. At full load, the output is going to be At full load, the output is going to be somewhere close to this, this level here, which will be 21.2 minus one, which is 20.2. So at full load, V1 is 20.2, right? Everybody following so far? So we have three answers. Let's look at this one, V4. V4 is a diode. 
What is the sister? What is the question? Tell me. The Zener diode is a ten-volt device requiring twenty milliamps for normal operation. So V four is ten. All right. If this is ten volts and it requires twenty milliamps for normal operation, it means that I four which is supplying the current to the, the diode. Remember, this is the, the, the diode resistor here. So I4 is 20 milliamps. Okay? So let me see, if V4 is 10, what is V5? If V4 is 10, what is V5? So it could be um, 10. 10 plus 0 0.71 volts. Exactly. So V5 is 10.7. And where's V3? So it could be the same 10.7 volts. Exactly. Right. So V3 is 10.72. Nice. Right. Let's look at V6 now. Here is 15. Because it's the output of the, the power supply, right? So what is this voltage here, which is V6? Just like you did for TR2, if this is 15, then what is V6? Fifteen point seven. Nice. Right, so look at how many answers we have there already. We have V1, we have V6, 5, 4, 3, uh, and 2. Right, so we get all the voltages already. We have I4, so now, and we have I1. So we have two more currents to thing. It's 10 marks of, uh, for this part. Eh? You already have eight here. So let's look at I3 now, right? These are the only ones that require a little bit of, of thinking. I3 is supplying the current um, into to, to, to TR2. And you're given in the problem that TR2 has a current gain of 150 and an ICQ of 20 milliamps, right? So VR5 once is operating in its quite um, quiescent state, it needs 20, how many, 10, 10 or 20? 10 milliamps, right? So the current coming through I3, which is supplying the, 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 the current for V5 is um, 20 milliamps. Uh, I keep saying 20, 10, 10. Right, so I3 is 10, right? And if HFE for TR2 is 150 and ICQ is 10 milliamps, then what is the base current for, what, what, what is the base current coming through here? Right, if ICQ here, is 10 milliamps and HFE for this is 150. IB is going to be what? It's going to be 10 milliamps divided by HFE, right? Yeah? I see, that'll be IC over HFE. Correct. ICQ over HFE and, we, and, and given that ICQ is 10 milliamps. All right? Okay. Uh, what about the, the, the um, actually we have another, Part of that. What about the, 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 the base current from um, for TR1? 
If this is carrying PR1 carries how much current? TR1 is carrying how much current? At full load. One, one arm, sir. Right. So TR1 is carrying one arm. So what is the base current of TR1? TR1 has 50. a current gain of 50. So the one arms, one over HFT, one over 50, which is. Right. Right. So the, the current here is one amp over 50, right? This current here, right? So this current is one amp over 50. This one is a 10 milliamps passing. So this transistor TR2 is in fact carrying this plus this, yeah? One over 50 is what? I think it's 20 milliamps, right? Yeah. Right. So TR2 is carrying 30 milliamps. So if TR2 is carrying 30 milliamps, the quiescent, which is 10, plus the 20 milliamps from biasing TR1, then the base current is 30 over 150. So the only current left now we have to calculate is I2. And what was the normally what we said? For H bias transistors, remember TR2 is a sort of H bias, that the current along here is typically about 10 times the base current here. All right? So whatever you calculate this to be, oops, whatever you calculate that, this value to be, the current flowing through the, the bias leg R1 and R2 should be about 10 times that. That's a rule of thumb. We spoke about that. Right? If at worst you said it was equal to that, mm, um, I would have let it go, but that's not, that not good design. Okay? Right? And that's it. We go through here. Let me show you what the... Right, so there's the oscillator bit here. All from the notes, all of this is... Cancel notes, right? So here we are. So we have all the calculations right inside here. All right. Okay. And that I thought, I really thought, now nah, when I put that, I deliberately put it down so that I didn't have to ask you, I didn't want you to because it, it would have been easy to, 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 to give you this and tell you, okay, draw an unregulated, sorry, draw a regulated power supply for me with a 10 volt diode um, and um, using um, trans a transistor element as a regulating um, device, right? But instead I give you it and, and, and notice you don't have any resistor values here. It was straight, it was very, very straight about, um, I think when we reached about, we have calculated eight values, I think, just by inspection without any sort of calculation whatsoever. All right. So this is a little surprising, and I um, thought most people would have done a little bit better here. And then the other part here now is that um, I give you again, I've given you a, a circuit, and I told you what this circuit is. That this circuit is this figure is using. Uh, right, that uh, here you have um, the additional components now where we've added some components now to make something called fold back protection and to calculate all of the additional components to make this work. And that again, um, the first thing that you do is that you have to pick a value for this. This is a current sense resistor. Right? And normally, I mean, an easy value, if I have to pick a value for a resistor, pick one ohm, right? So once you pick one ohm here, this is carrying um, one amp. 
So this is one ohm across here. This is 0 0.7 volt biasing across here. So that the they current, if you look at it, the voltage here between Vx and here, right? If, if you have this, so if this is 15 volts, right? Um, and you have, so you're carrying the current here, so the voltage here, V1, let's see. So V1 will be equal to 15 plus the current I by R4, okay? And then Vx, which is the voltage across here now, the voltage across R5 is V1, right? And in fact, the voltage across this whole thing, the, 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 the voltage between Vx and here, it's supposed to be 0.7 volts for the transistor to turn on. And you have everything else that you need at that point, right? If you look at it, so, so um, if, let me call here v V2, right? And it's all, all again in, in the slide itself. So V2 minus Vx is equal to 0.7, right? V2 is 15 volts. Right, so 15 minus Vx is equal to 0 0.7 volts. So you could calculate what Vx is. And then um, once you do that, then you pick a value typically, we said you pick a value for R6, and then using that now, you know what V1 is, and um, you could now calculate what the, what the value for R5, for, for R5 is. Right, and it's all, okay, let's go back to the solution. Right. So you need one transistor here. So IL is one arm, uh, R4, you choose that. You gotta choose another value, but this was important. A lot of people didn't, didn't pick this one. And then once you do that now, you pick a value for R6 and then you calculate R5 from that. Okay, but it's all simple circuit theory. Yeah? Starting to come back now, you remembering this stuff? Hmm? Yes, sir. <laughs> all right. So you see, I did, um, again, and I deliberately did it a little bit differently here. I gave you, the, I kind of asked you to, to take the circuit and draw draw the extra components required to, to make the fallback protection, but that would have involved you redrawing the entire schematic and putting in the components. So instead I said, okay, I'll give you the circuit and you do the analysis for me this time. Again, trying, because I know again, people are going back to face to face and trying to make it a little bit more straightforward. All right? Okay, so um, we'll be on, on 11 here. So I'll stop here. Um, on Friday, we will, I don't know if I'll make you draw it this time, but but again, once we more back interface interface to face, it's it's unlikely that I will make you draw over a, a huge circuit, right? Um, because that takes too much of uh, of time. But I am expecting you. Um, the kind of things I could ask going forward would be to to to, um, to give you a circuit, and and tell you, okay, this is supposed to be a circuit like for this. This is supposed to be a circuit for um full back protection but i omit one of the resistors in there for argument's sake and ask you um the circuit is not correct what um how would you correct it there's a variation of what i could ask okay um it's unlikely that that um i will again uh, attempt um to, to, to make it where you will draw and I, I will make this exam because i don't want to change the course from what you did um, last semester, I don't want to make a drastic change now, right? Next semester going forward, I'll, I'll change it up a bit again. But now, at this point in time, you're repeating it and we don't, we're not going through all of the material again, so I'm not, not going to add new things, right? You've already done this stuff, you have the slides, you have the videos and the past paper, so I'm not going to change it for you at this point in time, all right? Okay, 
So um, let me stop here. We will finish off this on, on um, Friday. And also, uh, again, I'm expecting you to, to tell me as well to, um, to start telling me some of the topics that, that we may need to go over a little bit of and, um, or spend some extra time on. And then um, we could take it forward from there. But the same approach that I told you we'll take um, from this morning is that we're going to do past papers. We're going to do the, um, answer the questions see where the sticking points are, and then get used to you um, either in class or on your own doing the questions um, and putting down a reasonable answer in the time that is allotted, <clears throat> right? One, one, um, so, okay, let me, let me stop the recording here before I close.